This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Green Pulse, a podcast series by The Straits Times where we analyze the beats of the changing environment, from biodiversity conservation to climate change. I'm your host, Audrey Tan, and I cover science and environment for The Straits Times. My co host is David Fogarty. Hi, I'm David, and I'm the climate change editor at The Straits Times. It is the 27th of September. Southeast Asia, a region of developing countries, is hungry for power. As the world emerges from the shadow of COVID-19, demand for energy is expected to go up. But a report by IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, showed that over 66% of the total installed power capacity in ASEAN in 2020 were fossil fuel plants. Yet, renewable energy options abound in Southeast Asia. Joining us to discuss the region's renewable energy potential is Mr. Mark Hutchinson. Chair of the Southeast Asian Task Force and Director for Asia at the Global Wind Energy Council. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hello, and uh, thank you for having me. So, Mark, based on the IRENA report, hydropower energy accounted for the largest percentage of total installed renewable energy generation capacity in ASEAN in 2020. So why was hydropower such a dominant renewable energy source in the region? Well, traditionally, you know, solar and wind had not yet been competitive with hydro. There are quite a number of rivers in in Southeast Asia. And so uh, as the fuel cost is is zero, uh, that was the initial focus of the development in the power sector when looking at renewables. So, Mark, what are some of the other renewable energy options that have not yet reached their full potential in Southeast Asia? For example, solar PV or onshore or offshore wind, for example. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Solar and wind, both onshore and offshore, still are nowhere near their potential here in Southeast Asia. Uh, as as just mentioned, hydropower has been been quite popular uh, historically. It's getting more difficult to build new hydro uh, because of you know relocation of population and indigenous people, other environmental issues. Biomass is relatively popular in a number of countries. Uh, but again, uh, believe it or not, some of the sources of biomass are actually running out. For example, rice from rice mills in, in Thailand is now, you know, it's getting scarce, getting the husks. So if you're going to be pushing renewables further, uh, there's really no option now except going wind and solar. And of course, uh, onshore wind has already been started in a number of countries in Southeast Asia. It's, it's offshore that I think has some of the greatest potential going forward in places like Vietnam and the Philippines, where the offshore wind is very strong. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, energy demand worldwide dropped due to a slowdown in economic activities. Uh, But what are the forecasts like for uh, energy growth in Southeast Asia in the next decade? And how fast can new renewable energy plants come online? The Yes, uh, demand dropped during COVID, but uh, interestingly, in in some countries, in particular Vietnam, the installation of solar and wind did not drop. Uh, There was a big surge in the development of solar and wind uh, during COVID. And, you know, in Southeast Asia, the the economies are relatively fast growing. So the energy demand will also be fast growing. And, you know, we see great opportunities for solar, wind, storage, uh, in almost every Asian country, Southeast Asian country, except a few. Malaysia doesn't have particularly good wind. Singapore doesn't have enough space. Uh, and Indonesia's wind is not that great either. So, Mark, Irina also recently said that Southeast Asian countries needed to more than double their annual investment on renewables to help them meet their climate change targets. An average annual investment of US $210 billion is needed on renewable energy and related infrastructure spending which is more than two and a half times the amount currently pledged by Southeast Asian governments to reach their goals. So would you say that the lack of funding is a key obstacle in getting renewable energy projects to come online more quickly? No, there is absolutely no lack of funding. There is so much money looking to invest in this industry. The The challenge is not the funding, the challenge uh, are the projects. And getting a project that has, you know, appropriate levels of regulatory support, you know, um, offtake contracts, 
uh, and other things is, is the challenge. The challenge has nothing to do with the technology or the cost because solar and wind are both cheaper than fossil fuels and on-grid uh, electricity prices now. It's all the regulatory market and other bottlenecks which are stopping the you know, further development of wind and solar in Southeast Asia. So can you elaborate on that? Because I think there was, there's a sort of impression that um, there's a lot of um, other non-renewable energy friendly policies or lobbying pressures, say by coal companies, um, that seem to hinder uh, the growth of renewables. So renewables being difficult to integrate, um, if you think about power systems, they've been run the same way for you know the last hundred or so years. You have a large power plant, whether it's coal or natural gas or hydropower, and those plants are typically 100% under the control of the utility, you know, the state-owned utility with the, the private utility, and they can tell when, tell when to turn on, tell it when to turn off. They know on that's on the supply side. On the demand side, they know when people come home from work. They turn on their air conditioners, their rice cookers, their TVs. So they can predict the demand and they can control the supply. So now what you're doing is with all these net zero and other sort of carbon commitments, ESG commitments, there's a push to bring in more renewables. And as I mentioned before, solar and wind are the cheapest. But you can't predict exactly when the wind will blow. You can predict fairly well when the wind will blow. You can predict reasonably well when the sun will shine, right? But the sun doesn't shine at night, right? And the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you have to build into the grids the flexibility to manage that. And if you look at markets where there are high penetrations of wind and solar, you can see that they've built in a lot of flexibility. That goes far beyond building just batteries you know, for storage, It includes cycling power plants in ways that they hadn't been cycled before, using hydro to balance out, you know, the intermittency of wind and solar. On the demand side, it means, you know, using innovative uh, demand management techniques, which means like uh, paying factories to change their schedules so that there isn't a huge surge in power demand just as the sun goes down. So there's a lot of different ways that it can be managed. But the grid, to, uh, to absorb all the additional wind and solar, the grid must be made more flexible. And by that, I mean everything from supply to demand, consumer behavior, business behavior, et cetera. So it does create additional challenges. It's not as easy to manage the grid with lots of solar and wind as it was in the old days when you told the power plant to turn on or off. But it can be done. And it's been shown that it can be done in other countries. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. And now back to our podcast episode. So could you give us some examples of um, cities or countries that have actually deployed uh, flexible grids to a, to a good extent? Yeah, so countries or states that have done this. So for example, South Australia, the state of South Australia, um, has on occasion uh produced 120% of its needs through wind and solar. Because they are connected to the national transmission system, they export the additional power. Um, other grids like the UK uh, has, has approached 100% uh, renewable energy. Ireland, Germany, California, they've all reached extremely high percentages of renewable energy. And, you know, the it's, it's inevitable that, that at some point it will top 100%. And that's where you need the storage uh, to be able to absorb it. But it's coming. It's a matter of, it's not a matter of if, it's when. So what did it take for them to make that switch? I mean, you talked about batteries and all that, and that was an important technical part that needs mm-hmm. to be integrated into the grid. But beyond that, what are some other key changes that need to be made to a traditional grid in order to make it flexible? Um, it can get pretty technical. Because there is this thing called system inertia, you have to manage both uh, voltage and frequency uh, down to the millisecond. <clears throat> so there are things like condensing capacitors and other types of actual grid management that you do. So technologies that you install upon the grid 
uh, sort of smart management of the grid. So uh, extremely detailed monitoring of all the different bottlenecks uh, uh, along the grid so that you know if you're going to be facing any challenges. Uh, weather monitoring and prediction. So for example, if you're all of a sudden you have this, you do your monitoring by your substation, and then all of a sudden there's a massive drop in energy input into that substation. Well, you know, maybe there's been a big cloud bank that goes over the solar farms that feed into that substation. So it's it takes a lot more effort. Yes, that's true. But it can be done through a whole variety of, you know, technology, you know, human behavior, uh, financial incentives, and, and other things. Um, what do you think it means for people living in an area with a flexible grid? For instance, should I only start running my energy-intensive appliances like a dryer only in the afternoons when the sun is shining? Yeah, I mean, think about it. If you have a, a time-of-use meter, and, and I believe it's available in Singapore for certain you know, classes, you could have pricing where in the middle of the day, you're encouraged to use electricity. Let's, let's just say Singapore has lots of solar, which it, it, it doesn't. But say in a country with lots of solar, you could be encouraged to charge your EV in the middle of the day, right? You could be discouraged from charging your EV at 7 p.m. when the sun goes down and everybody's turning on their air cons and TVs and starting to cook, right? So you could have pricing mechanisms that do that. And, and those price signals are what could, could drive behavioral change and you could end up you know, saving money um, while at the same time providing grid flexibility. And while that doesn't sound predictable, it is actually relatively predictable. If, if you are given a certain pricing incentive structure, the, the forecasters can actually use that to, to calculate what percentage of the people will actually charge their EVs in the middle of the day rather than at 7 p.m. when the sun goes down. And then they can use that to calculate what kind of you know, reserves they need to build into the system and, and so forth. But renewable energy projects are not entirely without environmental impacts. And we've seen how wind farms in some places like Brazil or India are having ne uh, negative impacts on bird life. So wind farms in Brazil, for instance, are threatening the habitat of uh, Lear's macaws, uh, which are threatened with extinction. So how can this tension be eased? There's, there's no question that any type of infrastructure project has environmental impacts, and wind is certainly no exception to that. I think what, what, what our members try to do is, is really um, apply best practice. And, and, and at times, that means going beyond the requirements of an individual's country's environmental impact assessments. So, for example, uh, I know for a, for a fact that some projects in a, a Southeast Asian country have gone above and beyond the requirements of that country's uh, EIA and that so that they they will be able to sell to international infrastructure funds once they reach you know on once they put the power you know the wind farm online now if they only did it to the local standards a lot of the international infrastructure funds for example will not invest if they don't if they haven't done all the proper bird migration and other studies so while you're never going to get to a zero bird kill, you know you can you can apply best practice to reduce the impacts as much as possible, and in, you know the infrastructure funds and, and the other investors, international investors are are driving this because they just won't invest in projects that can't show that they have done all the appropriate studies, move move the project if necessary to get it out of a particularly sensitive area, um, and. Yeah, so those investors are helping to drive this, which I, I think is a, is, a, is a good move. Thanks, Mark. And just to sum it all up, what would you say are your forecasts for the penetration of renewable energy options in Southeast Asia? I mean, according to the IRENA report, it's 66% fossil fuel total installed capacity in 2020. What would your forecast be for, say, 2030? Um, I think it's going to go down a lot because uh, I can, uh, during COVID, I was actually amazed that the energy transition actually accelerated. At the beginning of COVID, I was expecting everybody to focus on that, but it hasn't. And so, you know, I, I talked about a lot of some of the challenges, but one of the things that I like to see and I fully believe in is that 
human beings have an infinite ability to innovate and overcome challenges. And so, you know, what I see is that there's a lot of people working very hard trying to make this happen because, you know, as you said, the, the government leaders have made these commitments. And so I think that, you know, our members and, and others in the industry, other key stakeholders are all going to push really hard. Um, and I expect, you know, renewables to significantly increase. And I expect fossil fuel uh, consumption in the power sector, certainly in, in, in most countries in, in Southeast Asia, to be going down by 2030 versus now instead of going up. So yes, I'm positive for the future, but there's a lot of work to do. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Mark. No worries. Thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for Greenhouse, and we hope you enjoyed our discussion. For more on climate change and the environment, do check out our stories in The Straits Times. And don't forget to subscribe to our Green Pulse podcast series on your favourite audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts. That was a podcast by The Straits Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3, you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O.